have a job where children will be doting on him and brushing him and and pampering him and he's going to get treats and he's going to be spoiled. For now, Cowboy's riding days are far from over as a new adventure lies ahead. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Now, Cowboy is the second LAPD horse to be donated to the program. Well, as part of his ongoing work to green the valley, Councilmember Bob Blumenfield cut the ribbon on the new Blumenfield Waterwise Demonstration Garden at the West Valley Municipal Center in Reseda. That's the focus of this week in tweets. Three, two, one. Zero. Councilmember Bob Blumenfield's office tweeted a video of the ribbon cutting in Reseda, posting ribbon cutting at our Waterwise Demonstration Garden with 20,000 square feet of turf removed we can save 500,000 gallons a year. Blumenfield's office retweeted a post from the LADWP which showed a pic of the new water-friendly garden saying, Waterwise Demonstration Garden to save 500,000 gallons of water a year. Create your own. The LA Conservation Corps tweeted, Very proud of our core members who worked on this beautiful Waterwise Demo Garden in CD3. And the LA Public Library also tweeted about the event posting proud to be part of today's Waterwise Garden Ribbon Cutting and excited to see it become a beautiful blooming field. And that's a look at This Week in Tweets. Well, at 70, 80, sometimes 90 years young, many of LA seniors continue to make a difference in our neighborhoods. As Gil Reyes reports, one councilman threw a party to say thanks. <laughs> The young at heart having a good old time. Oh, wow, I'm, I'm doing the salsa and a little merengue. Hey, it's fun. Hundreds of seniors gathering here at the L.A. Convention Center for this special luncheon and talent show hosted by Councilman Curran Price. These are people from churches and senior centers from the Councilman South L.A. District primarily, and many of them don't mind telling you that they're remaining very active even during their retirement. Senior fraud is the number one form of elder abuse in the country. Adrian Omansky, a retired teacher, now leads an acting troupe made up entirely of seniors. These actors visit community centers and perform skits about hidden senior scams on the Internet. If you see anything on the computer that doesn't look right, delete. If someone calls you and says to you that you owe, owe money to the IRS, this is one of the number one scams in the United States. We need more seniors to become active. Amos Freed, a retired attorney, uses his legal skills to set up food assistance programs for the needy. This is something I am basically committed to try to... To, to help out in this issue, working with uh, the council people. The seniors bonded over chicken lunch and entertainment. It's a fun way to, uh, to celebrate uh, our community, bringing the community together, uh, and celebrating the special role that senior citizens play and continue to play in our community. Because for them, there's still much more to contribute. In downtown L.A., Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. And of course, lunch and entertainment were all free. Well, it was a long time coming, but residents in Woodland Hills finally can enjoy a new community amenity that honors local first responders. This fire truck represents former Fire Station 84, which used to be housed here at Canoga Avenue and Costanzo Street in Woodland Hills from 1949 until 2007 when the station was moved to a new location. And for nearly eight years before becoming this play area for kids, officials say the vacant lot was an eyesore in the community, falling into disrepair and creating blight in the neighborhood. But not anymore, as the site has been transformed into a neighborhood attraction. I am delighted. We just had this baby in March, and it's exciting for me to take walks in the neighborhood and feel comfortable in the neighborhood and stop over here and just sit on the grass and play with him. And one day, he'll be able to climb up there, so it's nice. As the lot sat empty, Council Member Bob Blumenfield reached out to the community to get their ideas on what they wanted at the site. The majority agreed on a park that would honor the old fire station. And after two years, they got what they asked for. Community members recently joined Blumenfield, the Department of Rec and Parks, and other city officials to help unveil and dedicate two new plaques. It's not only a great amenity, a parklet for this area, but also a great testament to 
our, our public safety folks and specifically for our firefighters. Residents say the new park adds value to the neighborhood by providing a place where families can gather and spend time. The $1 million park includes a red play structure in the shape of a fire truck, shade canopies, and a drought-tolerant garden. This is probably the best use of the property that I could think of uh, over the years. The unveiling comes several months after a ribbon-cutting ceremony introducing the park to the community. We really like the theme. It's, it's fun. The children seem to really like it, so we're excited about it. A fire truck that kids can call their own, and what can be better than that? The park will be open from dawn to dusk. Well, a fundraising event for you and your best friend, Beethoven comes to life as the L.A. Philharmonic kicks off its winter season and a ride at Griffith Park that will scare your socks off. All this in this week's Things to Do. Here's your chance to spend some quality time with your best bud. For 19 years, Best Friends Animal Society has hosted Strut Your Mutt, the fundraising walk and festival that helps raise money for local animal welfare organizations in cities around the country. And this year, they're upping the fun quotient by adding the timed 5K race to even more Strut Your Mutt events. So leash up your pup, unleash that inner athlete, and join the fun. Runners will start ahead of walkers, and after the race, awards will be given to the first place male and female finishers, as well as their pups. All runners get a great Strut Your Mutt technical shirt, while dogs receive their own sporty bandana just for participating. The event takes place on Saturday, October 10th at Exposition Park, located at 700 Exposition Park Drive. For tickets, prices, and to sign up, visit strutyourmutt.org. The L.A. Phil's winter season kicks off with the dramatic works of Beethoven for both young ones and adults. Pioneering symphonies for youth mix music with fun and fantasy for children ages 5 to 11. As part of the immortal Beethoven Festival, the Sim Bolvar Symphony Orchestra of Venezuela takes us on an imaginary tour of the house where Beethoven was born. Come for the chance to experience a live orchestra through the fantasy of theater in some of the most exciting music ever written. Each performance is preceded by a choice of art workshops, including an instrument petting zoo, dance, and more. The performance takes place Saturday, October 10th at 11 a.m. at the Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown L.A. For tickets to this concert and other immortal Beethoven performances, visit LAPhil.com. For thrill seekers, check out the Los Angeles Haunted Hayride. The famed Griffith Park attraction takes folks on a ride through the old zoo where they'll face the underworld and portrayals of the seven deadly sins. This year features new mazes, interactive theater, a 40-foot-long leviathan, and returning favorites such as the Scary Go-Round, House of Mirrors, and more. Tickets range from $30 to $58. The adventure begins at 7 p.m. at 4730 Crystal Springs Avenue in Griffith Park. Visit LosAngelesHauntedHayride.com for more. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay. And from all of us here at L.A. This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at LACityView.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of L.A. This Week. something very special for our first anniversary. Now close your eyes. Surprise! It's an emergency preparedness kit. Isn't it great? It's got food, water, first aid kit, and this neat emergency tool for shutting off utilities. Honey, we are going to be prepared for any emergency. Honey? Sweetie, I have one more surprise. This really cool cranking flashlight. Get the message? Be prepared. Don't hurt me this way Don't touch me this way When a physical encounter occurs between man and machine, the machine always wins. Please, don't lose. Obey all the rules of the road. Don't let me make 
the same mistake again. Don't worry, Patty. This isn't going to hurt me one bit. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Shapiro in beautiful Encino, and you're watching LA City View, Channel 35. Our city, our channel. Open wide.
Captain Vito from Olympic Station is with us. We can start. Good morning. Shh. Good morning. It is Tuesday, October 6th. I want to welcome you to your Los Angeles City Council. This council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m., and the public is welcome. Madam Clerk, we do have a, a quorum. Our captain from Olympic is here. We can, we can begin. Please call the roll. Blumenfeld, Bonin, Buscaino, Cedillo, Englander, Fuentes, Harris, Dawson, Wezar, Crest, Requiem, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rue, Wesson, 11 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Mr. Buscaino moves and Mr. Englander seconds. Next. Committed to resolutions for approval. Mr. Buscaino moves and Mr. Bonin seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, say it's Tuesday. Now be the time for the flag salute. I'm going to ask everyone to rise and we will be led in our flag salute by Mr. Buscaino. Thank you. I'll rise and face the flag, the greatest flag on the face of this earth. Together, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Buscaino. Let's run through the agenda. Madam Clerk. Items 1 and 2 are items noticed for public hearing. The Department of Building and Safety, uh, there's requests to continue items 1H, M, Q, Y, A, F, and A, J to October 20th, and continue items 1I and V to no November 10th. Also, the Department reports that items 1K, N, X, a, D, A, E, A, I, A, L, and A, N may be received and filed, and as much as the liens have been paid, there has been a recent change in property ownership, or the properties are single-family owner-occupied dwellings and exempt from lien. Okay, so without objection, that will uh, be the uh, order. Do we have cards? Yes, cards on both items. Okay, then let's move to the next set of agenda items. Items 3 through 27 are items for which public hearings have been held. Okay, 3 through 27, members, any specials? I do not see any. Um, let's prepare to hold item 27, I'm being told. Are we ready to go? Mr. President. Okay, we're ready. Mr. Krikorian? I call item three special, please. Three. We'll hold that or call it special for Mr. Krikorian. Okay, let's prepare to vote on the remaining items. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. And there's a request to send items 20 and 21 forthwith. Okay, without objection, that'll be the order. Let's move on, Madam Clerk. Items 28 through 34 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, uh, these items are, those items are now before the, this body. Do we have cards? Yes, cards on items 29, 30, 32, and 34. Okay, let's hold those items. Members, specials, I do not see any. Let us prepare to vote. Let us open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Continue. Mr. President, that brings counsel to uh, presentations or items called special. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to, before we begin with a very important presentation, we're going to take care of a couple of uh, housekeeping issues here. Uh, Mr. Price has arrived. Good 
go to item 29, Mr. Walsh. In fact, Mr. Walsh, uh, just stay here. We're going to go through your items. So please come forward. This is on item 29. John Walsh, welcome to City Council. HollywoodHighlands.org, tweeting at Hollywood Dems. Uh, number 29 concerns housing. As you know, we have a horrible housing situation here in Los Angeles. And this concerns the rent escrow account program, which is a good program, which uh, means that if your landlord does not repair your unit according to code, you can go right to the city, and after that, he doesn't get the rent anymore. It goes into escrow, and he doesn't get it till he repairs your apartment. Remember that. They'll never tell you that. Only a renter like me will tell you. That's what REAP is, R-E-A-P. Find out about it. One minute. Thank you. Let's prepare to vote on this item. Mr. Walsh, don't go anywhere. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Item 30, Mr. Walsh. Item 30? Yes, sir. John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org, tweeting at Hollywood Dems, or go to J. Walsh Confidential. This is the unsafe, unhealthy site conditions at a housing set asset formerly owned by the Community Redevelopment Agency. Now, we abolished the Community Redevelopment Agency, and the tax money that was going to them is now going to the state and to education. And uh, in the last four years, we are responsible. We who fought the CRA for six billion, three hundred million dollars going to the city, the county, and education and special districts that would have gone to the CRA. And even though they got all that money, you can see that the CRA was doing a terrible job on housing assets. There is no more CRA. This little baby CRA they created is nothing. HollywoodHighlands.org. Thank you. Don't go far, Mr. Walsh. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay. Mr. Walsh, 32. 32, 32, sir. 32. This concerns the national, oh, this concerns an exemption from one principal project. What is an exemption? The charter says that you must have certain qualifications to hold positions in the city, unless the city council votes to exempt you. Now, that means that they don't mention the name of this person, or this coordinator for emergency management department, but that person does not have the qualifications. Remember, anytime I say something wrong, they jump on me. Anytime I, they don't say anything, it means I'm correct. So what they're doing here is allowing an unqualified person, according to the city charter, unqualified uh, to uh, take over this emergency management. Now, in other cities like New York, Chicago, hundreds, thousands of these jobs. Here, we had reform, but the reform is gone now. And what we have here in this city of Los Angeles is many, many people. And how do you get these jobs? You're a friend with the mayor or the mayor's lover Mr. Glenn Dake, or the mayor's design. wife, or Mr. Rue's friends, or Ms. Price friends, and then you get an exemption, and then they cut, but they have to vote it here. Now, they're not going to say one word. Not one person up here is going to ask, who is this exemption for? What are their qualifications? And remember, this is emergency. We will need a, a, the most qualified people on earth in emergency, and this unnamed person. Don't worry about city, uh, 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 the reporters, they don't give a damn. They're sitting back there smoking weed. HollywoodHighlands.org, this exemption, and these exemptions come through all the time, and we have a host 
of unqualified people, especially in emergencies. And they don't give a damn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Don't go anywhere. Let's prepare to vote. Members, let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Thirteen eyes. Okay. Uh, now, how much time does Mr... Okay, Mr. Walsh, you have one minute on this one. It's item 34. John Walsh blogging at hollywoodhighlands.org or J. Walsh Confidential. Okay, these are the maps. What are the final maps mean? The only reason you don't have a high rise or a mini mall next to you are these maps. These maps are the, uh, give the entire area, the zoning. What they do is slip a, an amendment into the maps. No one will ask any questions here. And all of a sudden, when you see them building a hotel, a motel, whatever they're building next to you, it's because of these final maps. Now, do you hear anyone say anything about this? No. You'll only hear this or when I speak about it, at various council districts, hollywoodhighlands.org for the truth. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Let's prepare to vote on this. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Thirteen eyes. Okay, before I call on Joey B. Mr. Buscaino, let's move to item two. Do I have a Kevin Michael Key? Kevin Michael Key, item two, Kevin Michael Key. Good morning, council members. Um, I work for the United Coalition East Prevention Project. We do alcohol and other drug prevention in the downtown Skid Row area. And we are opposed to um, the granting of PCNN, public convenience and necessity, with respect to um, this outlet due to the oversaturation and the other um, alcohol and other drug related issues and nuisances that are consistent with oversaturation, we would ask that you um, deny the application. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, on this item, let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 eyes. At this point, I'd like to uh, give the floor to our dear friend and colleague, Mr. Joe Buscaino. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. It's great to declare the month of October Italian Heritage Month. Go ahead, guys. Um, so what did you say? Let's give it a round of applause. <laughs> We're going to declare this month. Let's go, yeah. Allora, oggi siamo tutti italiani. We are all Italian today, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Um, and before we kick off our festivities, uh, we are going to begin uh, the program with the singing of our national anthem. All rise, please stand.
now to sing the Italian national anthem. Help me welcome students from Franklin Magnet Elementary School. Yes. Joe, you see how they look on the screen so they can, yeah, see, they can themselves see themselves on television. Yes. <laughs> allora, siamo pronti? Quasi. Okay, Ken. Non c'è la musica. Ivan. Non c'è la musica. Seguire. Chiaro? Siamo pronti? Musica? No musica. No musica, va bene. A cappella. Okay, a cappella. Here we go. Ferra. Thank you. Wonderful. How beautiful. How beautiful was that, colleagues? Students uh, from San Pedro of Italian descent singing um, the national anthem, and students of, from Franklin Magnet Elementary School, most uh, who are not of Italian descent, singing the Italian national anthem. Was that beautiful or what? Bravi. Thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. Of course, we think of Italy, we think of art and music and culture and food and the significant contributions Italians have made not only to the city but also to this country. Um, I'd like to welcome Miss Janet DeMay from Casa Italiana Opera House to uh, kick off the festivities with a wonderful wonderful opera song, Miss DeMay.
Sins of Pietro Sodom. No, no. It is the Rosario. Janet DeMay, thank you so much, Ms. DeMay. Appreciate you. Allora, ancora una volta sono onorato uh, di chi ha questa mese, il mese di eredità italiana-americana. I'm proud again to declare this month Italian American Heritage Month in the city of Los Angeles. Colleagues, each and every year, the President of the United States signs an executive order designating the month of October as National Italian Heritage Month, uh, which recognizes the many achievements and contributions of Americans of Italian descent, as well as of Italians in America. Over 5.4 million Italians immigrated to the United States from 1820 to 1992, and today there are over 26 million Americans of Italian descent in the United States, making them the fifth largest ethnic group. As is always stated in these John Ferraro Council Chambers, as uh, John Ferraro is smiling down upon us today, one of our greatest uh, city strength is its diversity. And that's why it's important that we not only remember our roots, but nourish and harness them. And during Council recess uh, this last week, I spent, tra I spent the week traveling the homeland where my parents migrated to, that's Cis migrated from, that's Sicily. There I spent time meeting with mayors of Sicilian cities in Bagheria, Trapetto, Teresini, Cinisi, and San Vito Lo Capo, dignitaries and officials of the Port of Palermo, where we discussed our respective local policy issues, our respective solutions to those issues, and planned future collaborations, specifically working on establishing a friendship port relationship with the Port of Palermo. Through the California National League of Cities, where we share ideas on how to solve various problems, uh, we can also uh, share ideas from cities abroad, thus tapping into our historic and cultural roots to not only help us figure out where we come from, but also brainstorm on how to fix our problems and move forward using our history and roots. When we work with cities abroad, we foster international trade and therefore Catalyze, uh, therefore take advantage of the economic act activity, especially when we have the busiest port here of North America, the Port of Los Angeles. And this is why we declare October Italian Heritage Month in the city of Los Angeles. 
Um, I've invited a number of key individuals here to speak, including our Consul General, who I will soon bring up. But the one individual that I want to recognize is my bride. Of, we'll be celebrating 15 years tomorrow. Uh, my wife, Jay Buscaino. And uh, with, with all due respect, Mr. Koretz, she is my favorite karaoke partner today. <laughs> Mr. Antonio Verdi, our Italian Consul General of Los Angeles, his jurisdiction colleagues include Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico. Uh, Mr. Verdi's experience spans a diversity of sectors, including banking and publishing, um, and whose foreign, public foreign services include assignments in Tokyo, Moscow, Australia, not to mention fields such as energy and environment and immigration. Here in Los Angeles, Mr. Antonio Verdi has dedicated his time and work to fostering strong relationships between the Italian Consul and other Itali local Italian institutions, such as the Italian Trade Agency, the Italian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Italian Cultural Institute, and other key stakeholders, such as the Tourism Board. He is also committed to increasing Italian language and culture inst instruction at our local schools here in Los Angeles. And by having a strong emphasis on establishing and nourishing relationships between local Italian cultural and business organizations, and by introducing Italian cultural to our youth, we create economic activity between our city here and cities throughout Italy and the rest of the Mediterranean. Um, come si dice, um, quando lavoriamo insieme, Rafforziamo le nostre forze e riduire al minimo le nostre debolezze. Con riporti uh, culturali e commerciali possiamo crescere insieme le nostre proprie industrie. And just like I told the mayors in Sicily, when we work together we strengthen our strengths and minimize our weaknesses. With cultural and commercial relationships we can grow together our respective industries. Um, help me welcome our Italian Consul General, Antonio Verdi. Council members, ladies and gentlemen, the proclamation of October as Italian Heritage Month in Los Angeles is a well-deserved recognition of Americans of Italian descent and of their contribution to the growth and development of this great city since its earliest days. And we thank Councilman Buscaino for bringing this about since it also allies the key influence Italian culture and lifestyle have historically exerted in this part of the world. Dedicating this month to the celebration of the, cell, of the Italian heritage is extremely meaningful for the Italian and the Italian-American communities since it symbolizes the commitment of the city of Los Angeles to honoring their heritage, history, and culture. The proclamation also expresses the relationship of respect, friendship, and cooperation existing between Italy and Los Angeles, fostering this ties is the primary mission of the Consulate General of Italy and all the Italian institutions in Los Angeles, from the Cultural Institute to the Trade Commission to the Thailand Tourist Board to the American Chamber of Commerce. During this coming month, the Greater Los Angeles will be home to a series of high-profile events to celebrate the role of Italian culture in the historical framework of this country's growth and development and the uninterrupted flow of creativity that continues to characterize its culture. For example, on October 10, beautiful Pico House, we lost the taste of Italy, and of course, Columbus Day celebration are a precious opportunity to remember the role that Italians have played in making the city of Los Angeles the modern and open metropolis we know and love. And in neighboring Santa Monica, a month-long celebration showcasing the best of Italian culture including fashion, food, art, and music called Ciao Italia, has just started. On the 17th, we'll bring you at broad stage a salute to Frank Sinatra's 500th birthday. 
hosted by Barbara Sinatra. I hope you will join us and look forward to see you there. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much for honoring Italy with this Heritage Month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Verdi. Grazie. Grazie mille. Colleagues, we will honor three um, individuals who have made significant contributions to the Italian-American community as it relates to preserving uh, the Italian heritage culture here in the city of Los Angeles. Our first honoree is the executive director of the Italian-American Museum of Los Angeles, uh, also known as IMLA, a historian, an author, an advocate, a nonprofit leader, and a dear friend, Miss Mariana Gatto. Can we bring her up, please? I missed my second kiss. Okay, it's okay. And Damiano. And Damiano. Damiano, vieni. Joining uh, Miss Gatto is her son, uh, Damiano Damien, and also the board president of the Italian American Museum, Mr. Paul Pagnoni. But colleagues and Mr. President, if I may, um, before I continue um, reading Mariana's bio and achievements, I can think of no better way to show our appreciation to her and, and uh, the entire board and the efforts made by preserving and um, putting together this incredible Italian museum by taking up uh, item number 27 on today's agenda, which we know uh, Mariana has worked tirelessly on for many, many months. If we can take item 27. Item 27 is now before us. Colleagues, item 27 is an Arts and Parks River Committee report. Uh, thank you for your leadership, Mr. O'Farrell, for hearing this in your uh, committee, and also to Mr. Wiesar, who's the Italian, whose district includes the Italian Museum. Thank you for your commitment, Mr. Wiesar, for embracing and supporting uh, the uh, Italian American Museum, uh, the Italian Hall. Um, this item before us, recommending the approval of a 10-year lease agreement with the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles with three 10-year renewal options for space at the Italian Hall building in El Pueblo. Over $2 million has, all, has already been raised and expended by the nonprofit Historic Italian Hall Federation for the renovation, improvements, and maintenance of the museum and the Italian Hall building. And they have committed to raising an additional $500,000 in the initial 10-year period and $500,000 during each renewal option period for improvements, exhibits, and artifacts. I also like to recognize um, from the El Pueblo Commission, Commissioner Sal Di Costanzo, who's here, uh, who's actually videotaping. Thank you, Commissioner. And of course, our General Manager, Chris Espinosa. Thank you, Mr. Espinosa, for your leadership. So, colleagues, I ask that we support item 27 before us. I ask for an aye vote. Okay, Mr. Cedillo. I rise, obviously, to support this. There is incredible leadership, Marion Gatto, because the most appropriate person that you could uh, select to be honored on this. You mentioned that there were um, $2 million raised and spent, and I want to give credit to the great, uh, with all due respect to Mr. Ferraro, the great Italian of the city, yes. Joe Sorrell. You, you, you remember this, uh, Mr. Speaker, Joe Sorrell was a frequent visitor of the assembly and had heard of our efforts to fund the Chinese Museum. And we had the legislation ready to go to fund the Chinese Museum. We we're going to give them a million dollars. And so Joe Sorrell and his great skill of lobbying and his humble way comes up, much like you with his hands crossed like that, his head down, <laughs> and said, uh, you know, I hear you're giving a million dollars to the Chinese Museum. And they say, yes, Joe, we worked very hard. We're very excited about that. And he says, you know, gee, I wish you could give a million dollars to the Italian Museum. You know, we've got all this work to do, and we've got to restore it and protect it. And I said, well, Joe, that's great, but, you know, it's kind of late in the session, and we're at the end, and it's, uh, you know, we really want to move this. And he said, well, Gil, you know, I really would appreciate it if you could do this. <laughs> so in his humble way, as uh, Joe was, uh, we gave it a shot. And so we put another million dollars in the proposal, and we called it the Marco Polo 
And we said only in America and only in downtown Los Angeles and only at El Pueblo could we unite all these communities together. And could we have legislation that talked about how the Italians went to China and where pasta came from and then how they all ended up in downtown Los Angeles. All that is part of the rich history. Uh, it's the precursor, the historical precursor for these communities coming together. And you're right, uh, Mr. Buscaino, diversity is our strength. And no, there's no place more uh, emblematic of that diversity than El Pueblo. And so it's so appropriate for you to honor Ms. Gato for her incredible leadership uh, and the Italian Hall and its leadership. So congratulations. And Mr. President, I speak in honor of the motion, in favor of the motion. And you passed it. <laughs> okay, Mr. Wizar. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what a great presentation, uh, Mr. Buscaina. We know that uh, how uh, incredibly important it is for you to talk about your Italian roots, and uh, it's great to see that now with an Italian-American here in council once again, uh, we continue to fulfill these chambers with uh, Italians from all walks of life, but to have you feel that pride and joy of being an Italian, we couldn't have a better representative on this council than you, Mr. Buscaino. And Ms. Ms. Gatto, uh, congratulations to you. You know, you along with Mr. Pagnoni and the board at the Italian American Hall have single-handedly brought back a project that many people thought would not happen. Uh, when I first got elected in 2005, I heard about how the old dilapidated museum was just sitting there rotting away and not only not fulfilling its promise about bringing back and talking to people about, about the heritage of Italians in Los Angeles, but the history of Los Angeles itself right. and people who built this great city. So congratulations to you. Wonderful, wonderful recognition. And I recall back uh, in budget and finance, we were able to allocate about $2 million to start the effort. It's great to see that uh, it continues through fundraising efforts. That was the idea all along, that if the city put some money in to start the capital improvements, that the private sector would step up and continue the project, and we were able to do that. So congratulations to you, to all your board. Wonderful, wonderful job. Congratulations. Mr. Root. My brother from another mother. <laughs> you know, thank you so much We're for today. We're all related. We're yeah. all related, right? Thank you so much for such a wonderful um, a presentation today, and it just livened up the mood here at City Hall. And I see your parents there, and I went to go say hi, and I was afraid they were going to take me to the side and offer me some beverages. <laughs> <laughs> Lemoncello, right. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, as an immigrant, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's so great when we share the diversity in our cultures and our roots. Um, you know, Los Angeles is made up of immigrants. The United States is made up of immigrants, and it's about sharing and, and learning from each other. And, you know, not only do we have numerous links, we also have another. I have the fortunate opportunity to uh, continue the legacy of Councilmember John Ferraro. Right. And um, I take that to heart. And um, we're inextricably linked. And thank you so much for this presentation today. And thank you. And congratulations to the Italian-American community. Right. Back to you, Mr. Buscaina. Fantastic. If we can take item 27, again, we, I ask for an I vote and hope we can get unanimous um, approval of this item before us. Okay, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Fifteen ayes, that is, that is approved. Forthwith. Mr. Yes, sir. Buscaino. Thank you. Fourth How appropriate. Whip. Mariana Gatto's grandparents fled from poverty and social inequality in Calabria and Sicily in the early part of the 20th century. Her grandfather was a steel worker and laborer, and her grandmother was a sweatshop worker. They settled in Lincoln Heights, which at the time was Los Angeles' little Italy. Mariana father, Mariana's father, God rest his soul, Joseph Gatto, taught her the importance of education and appreciation of her Italian roots. Mariana has lived in Los Angeles all her life, born and raised in the Silver Lake and Los Feliz area. She attended UCLA, Cal State LA, and graduated magna cum laude in social science and history. 
She then got her teaching credential in secondary education into master's in history. She turned down the opportunity to teach at an exclusive private school to teach students in Skid Row. She's also served as a curator of history and education for the city of Los Angeles and has produced many acclaimed exhibitions, including the one we brought down to San Pedro. Sunshine, struggle to sunshine. Sunshine to struggle, I remember that. Um, and that's where she met her husband. I, I take credit for that. Mariana is responsible for over a million dollars of allocation of city funding and over a million dollars privately raised for the Italian American Museum project. She has drastically enhanced the museum's collection and created its signature annual event, The Taste of Italy, this Saturday. I know Mr. O'Farrell we will see you there. Hoping you all can join us. Mariana Gatto enhances the knowledge of Italian history through community involvement and through her research publications. Help me honor Mariana Gatto as one of this year's Italian Heritage Month honorees. Thank you and good morning. Um, essentially what I'm being recognized uh, this morning for is uh, doing what I love. And uh, that's a very great feeling, uh, memorializing the lives of others. So thank you Councilmember Buscaino for this recognition. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge my son Damien who for the past 21 years of his life has inspired me to be a better person. And um, I'd like to dedicate this award to my grandparents uh, who faced uh, pretty awful treatment in this country when they first arrived, like many immigrants past and present, uh, but their struggles made my life, our lives, possible. And uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. We're so happy to, look for, uh, to uh, work with you on the museum project and uh, bring the multi-layered history of our city to the masses. Uh, the museum is not simply for or about Italian Americans, but really a, a loving tribute to our uh, region's diverse roots. So thank you so much. Okay, Trini family, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, congratulations. The Trini family, amazing family with us today from San Pedro. Classic Italian-American immigrant success story. Filippo Trini arrived at Ellis Island on August 25th, 1913, at the age of 18. Fantastic from the Italian central coast island of Ischia, which is our sister city uh, in Italy. He farmed and fished for years until he was able to open up the iconic and legendary Majestic Cafe in 1925, where he fed everyone from dock workers to celebrities. The restaurant became a family heirloom when, uh, in 1937, Filippo Traini's son joined him in operating the restaurant. After the original, Majestic closed in 1989. Son Jim Trainey opened J Trainees in San Pedro, and among its, among its regulars were Tom, was Tommy Lasorda. Dustin Trainey, a fixture at J Trainees since the age of six, influenced by his grandfather Jim Trainey Sr. and his father Jim Trainey Jr., started cooking at an early age by learning the family's secret recipe. Dustin also studied in the Italian truffle region, trained by the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok, Thailand, and was a chef at the People's Cafe in Zagreb, Croatia. He is now an award-winning chef here in Los Angeles. Phil Trainey, Jr., son of Filippo, also has a great location in Long Beach, uh, which has been there now for 25 years. The restaurant has hosted numerous professional athletes, coaches, sports writers, including Tommy Lasorda, Jerry West, John Wooden, Bill Sharman, um, and Mark Sanchez, among others. This year, uh, J Trainee's restaurant in San Pedro celebrated its 90th year. Help me welcome and introduce and acknowledge the Trainee family. Good 
Rocco, look. Yeah. Come here, Rocco. Come here, Adam boy. Yeah. <laughs> And joining us, the newest generation of the Trainee family, Rocco Trainee. I lo love that kid. Look at him. Okay, want to say a few words? Wants to speak. Guys. Good to see you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having us here today. On behalf of the entire Trainee family, we would love to thank uh, the city of San Pedro the city of Long Beach, and the entire county for embracing our family and allowing us to live the American dream. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> and last but most definitely not least, we have with us today Mr. David Cristofaro, who is the Executive Vice President and Lead Region President for Wells Fargo Bank overseeing 268 stores and more than 5,000 team members, and serves customers across Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Riverside counties throughout the Coachella Valley. Before entering and climbing the ladder in the banking industry, Mr. De Cristofaro grew up in the Bronx of New York City, where he attended a predominantly Italian school, St. Teresa Elementary School. His father migrated to North America in 1958 in the region of Molisi, his mother migrated from the Avellino province in the Campania region. Mr. De Cristofaro contributes uh, to the culture and community of the LA region by serving as board chair of the Pasadena Playhouse, vice chairman of the American Red Cross of Greater LA, and also is a huge supporter of the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles. Help me recognize Mr. David De Cristofaro. So first of all, thank you to um, President Wesson, the City Council, and especially uh, Councilman Buscaino uh, for this tremendous recognition. Uh, to be honored as an Italian of distinction in Los Angeles is so very special to me. As the son of immigrant Italians, I can't express how incredibly meaningful it is to be recognized today. I'm so appreciative of this honor. I also want to thank and acknowledge our, honoree, our fellow honorees today, Mariana Gatto. Congratulations. Thanks for everything you do. And looking forward to Taste of Italy on Saturday. <laughs> as well as the, uh, the Trani family for all of the great work you do in bringing uh, delicious Italian cuisine to Southern California for so long. Also want to thank and acknowledge my friends and family that are here today, so thank you all for being here. Um, I also want to take a moment to, to, um, to especially thank my parents, my family. Uh, they could not be here today. They're back in New York. I can tell you it was incredibly painful for my mom to not be here, but uh, unfortunately she could not make it. Now my good friend and colleague, who I think many of you know, Jonathan Weedman, he likes to say there are two types of people in the world, those who are Italian and those who want to be Italian. <laughs> yes, and boy is he right. Uh, I, I just returned from my first trip this past September to Italy, and um, this joke has renewed meaning for me. I had the opportunity to visit Amalfi, Rome, Tuscany, Florence, amazing cities with incredible food, incredible sights to see. Uh, I, I was just blown away by how incredible it was. Uh, the people and the culture were even more vibrant than I expected. But without question, the visit to my parents' towns was the most important and impactful, memorable part of the trip. My father is originally from a very small town of fewer than 300 people called San Stefano, a small city outside of Cambu Bas in the region of Molise. My mother is from a, another very small part of Italy called Cerenaria in an area called, a city called Avellino uh, in the province of Campania. Strolling through their hometowns and witnessing their tiny gray stone dilapidated structures where they grew up, they had a pig pen next door, seeing the fields where my grandfather would tend to sheep uh, in the morning and throughout the day, uh, I could not help 
but develop a renewed appreciation for the journey that they started in 1958 that took them from their small Italian towns to New York City with the hope of building a better life for themselves and their family. My trip gave me a new sense of the perspective of where my family came from, but quite frankly, all of our families came from. Whether we're Italian or simply one of those that aspires to be Italian, and what it really means to have the courage to leave our homeland in search of greater prosperity. It is amazing that we live in a country where the sons of two Italian immigrants who came to this city with literally nothing can work his way up to become Wells Fargo's president of Greater Los Angeles and stand in the council of the city of Los Angeles and be recognized by our esteemed city council, something we should all be proud of. This is truly a country of great opportunity and it is incumbent on all of us to honor this by giving back to the communities in which we live and work. That is why I am so thankful for the ability to work for Wells Fargo, a company that truly cares for our communities and values diversity. I like to say Wells Fargo is the leading corporate citizen in Los Angeles, and I am proud to say that Wells Fargo has been named the top corporate philanthropist for the last 10 years by the LA Business Journal, and annually our team members give volunteer more than 30,000 hours of community service each year. At Wells Fargo, we know we can only be as strong as the strength of our community, and today I humbly and gratefully accept this wonderful award on behalf of our amazing community, my caring company, my courageous family, and the many daring immigrants who came to this country in search of greater opportunity this year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Colleagues, I'd like to introduce our very own Italian-American here in the city family, um, our very own um, LAPD captain in uh, Mr. Wesson's district, Captain Vito Palazzolo di Teresini. Hey, Cap. Also, uh, Councilwoman Nuri Martinez, uh, Chief of Staff, um, I love the uh, red, white, the Italian band there representing the Chief of Staff, Channel 35, we got to get a shot of that, Mr. Jim D'Antona. There you go, stay put, stay put. There he is. Really proud. Um, we, we can't forget also uh, an Italian-American, my colleague, Mike Bonin. Did you know that his mom, Beth Constantino, is Italian as well. Mike, please stand and take a bow representing the Italian American community. Your mom's not here, she is here in spirit. Missing the Italian Fest this weekend because I will be back on the East Coast with her eating, sorry folks, the best meatballs and, pie right. and tomato sauce in the world. <laughs> All right. Also, let's be reminded that Mayor Garcetti's great-grandparents immigrated from Italy to Mexico, and I believe he may be joining us a little bit later. Um, in addition, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Florentino Blastolino, who is our trade commissioner. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward to working with you to establish better relationships between our respective countries as it relates to trade and commerce and science and technology. We're going to do great work in the year ahead. Also, um, a number of Italian organizations joining us here, Federated Italo-Americans of Southern California, the Trapetto Club of San Pedro, the National Italian American Foundation, Italian American Museum of Los Angeles, the Italy America Chamber of Commerce, the Feast of San Gennaro, the Italian American Club of San Pedro, Casa Italiana Opera House, the Sister City of Ischia Foundation, the Italian Catholic Federated Branch 115. And um, we'd like to close, colleagues, um, this year's um, Italian Heritage Month Council presentation with the performance of uh, students from the San Pedro area. If, if I may, yes. if I just may interrupt for a second for, for two quick things. I, I do want to acknowledge uh, a former assemblyman and a friend of many of us here, former assemblyman Anthony Portentino. We should give him a round of applause. And I know, I think I shared this uh, uh, story with, with you, Mr. Buscaino, but I feel compelled to, to share it again. I went to a uh, Catholic high school in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, at a time 
when um, there were serious problems were rela well there were racial issues very similar to a lot of the racial issues that right. we have in some parts of the country today for the first two two and a half weeks that I went to school at five five 105 pounds I got jumped on and beat up every day wow. every day to the point where it was so bad that one of my buddies fathers owned a barbershop he gave me a straight razor to take to school because I was not going to get beaten again and as I was going home again I was surrounded by a group of guys that were going to beat me up I reached in my pocket because I was not going to just I fought every time but this time I was just not going to go down without really injuring somebody and then like in a movie there was a voice that came from nowhere indicating that from this moment on that Herb Wesson was an honorary son of Italy <laughs> All right. uh, no and well, that if you mess wow. with him you mess it's with us <laughs> and I never ever ever had a problem let that be school. true today. If you mess with her, you mess with us. <laughs> well, <laughs> but what it was, it just showed a group of guys that uh, thought it was stupid. And uh, we became friends. And I just want to know that I don't know where my life would have been uh -huh. if it weren't for them coming in and, and at that point in time. I surely may not be sitting before you today. So I do feel like I'm an honorary yes, son. Yes, sir, you are. And I think this is a great day. And I think we should give another round of applause for a group of people that helped shape Thank this you. country. Thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. And before, as the kids are setting up, I do want to recognize uh, my mom and dad are here, my sister, my mother-in-law, my my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, my aunts and uncles and cousins. Let's give them a round it's of applause. A, it's a family yeah. affair here. We love you. Love you guys. Okay, this is our closing song. And you know us. Sing along, Mr. Kretz, if you know it. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's a morning. When the world seems to shine like you had too much wine, that's a morning. Bells go ring, tingling-a-ling, tingling-a-ling, and you'll sing me. Play. 
Let's hear it for Rich Deanna, true, out of Chicago, but has San Pedro in his heart. Thank you, Rich. We love you. He is San Pedro's Billy Joe, right, Jay? So don't forget this uh, Saturday, Taste of Italy, uh, and our Buscaino block party spaghetti dinner on Sunday, October 11th at Weymouth Corners, noon to 4. Colleagues, you've all been invited. Please bring your friends and family. Free event on Sunday in San Pedro. Um, thank you so much. A, may, a number of individuals that helped put today's uh, event together and some program going on throughout the month in the entire region. Ann Potenza, Marcella Tyler, Emanuele uh, Banibianco, Frankie Capitelli, Josephine Shimatara, Mariana Gatto, Hector Garcia of Farmer John's, Paul Galetti of Southwind Foods, Janet DeMay, Rich Deanna, of course, Antonella Hartel, Ventura uh, of students at Franklin, Umberto uh, Bonfante, uh, for the espresso and Dustin Trainee from Dona. Thank you so much. God bless you, and thank you for joining us. There's a, a lunch reception. Everyone's invited at the forecourt. Everyone's invited at the lunch reception following uh, the presentation. Thank you, Mr. President. All right. Well done, Mr. Buscaino, and congratulations. Thank you. We'll go to item one at this point. So as people are exiting the chambers, if I could have Corey Sims begin to work his way down to the podium. Corey, we're on item one. In fact, it's my understanding 1G has been continued. Are we certain, Madam Clerk? Yes, Mr. President, item 1G has been continued to October 20th. Okay. Okay, Arnaldo Gutierrez. Mr. Gutierrez. It's 1L. Sorry, my name is Arnold. Shh. If we could have some silence, we still have business. Mr. Gutierrez. Yes, my name is Arnold Gutierrez. I've, it's been continued to, for four weeks, I believe. Yes, I was going to officially uh, make Announce that. It. So anyway, it, it, it will be continued for four weeks. Madam uh, Clerk, that will bring us to what exact day? November 10th. November so it 10th. will be continued to November 10th. And, okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. And also, Mr. President, uh, there's been a request to continue items 1A to November 10th and items 1AC to October 20th. Okay, without objection. Gregory Thompson, please come down, sir, to the center aisle. Go right ahead, sir. Oh, uh, 
Yeah, uh, my name is Gregory Thompson, and I was uh, summoned here today to uh, answer the summons that it was glued onto my house one afternoon I came in. I'm the owner of 1500 East 20th Street, and I do resign there. And I have been working with the uh, S Historical Society about the property. The property is over 150 years old, and there's some African-American history, some significant history that uh, belongs to that property. Uh, in the late 1800s, my uh, grandfather came, my uh, uh, grandfather's father came here and, start, and opened and bought that property, building and working on the railroad. And uh, he had a, a feed store out of the property, and he did it later on, he turned it into a, a, the first African-American Baptist church here in Los Angeles. So we've been researching the property to find out. So far, we found out that uh, Amy McPherson was, uh, used to come there and uh, do some preaching. So they're looking into it to find out exactly the significance of uh, what the property is all about. And uh, so uh, that's the reason why, you know, I fenced it up and just did what I done. Was my understanding, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, we're going to receive and file this. This has been deemed owner-occupied. So uh, he's primarily getting what he, or he's getting what he is requesting. Am I accurate on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. Uh, this property is owner-occupied. We talked to the property owner. He came to the office. He gave us the documentation that's required. So we requested that uh, this item gets uh, received and fired. I think it's uh, item one, one. I, uh, so it should uh, we recommend that uh, it gets received and fired because it's owner occupied. Fine. Okay, so I think you're you're good, sir. Okay. And if you need to have further conversation, you can have it with the man in the red and black vest. But uh, I think that you got the kind of action that uh, uh, you, you had hoped you would get when you came here this morning. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do I have a, uh, a Ruhi? I remember this name. Wingan, Wingran, Wingan. Ruhi? Ruhi? And uh, Benjamin Afshani or something like that? Benjamin. F. Sony, Shani. And Mr. President, as she's coming, there's also a request to continue item 1S to October 20th. Okay, without objection, that'll be the order. Yes, ma'am. Um, so it has been postponed, sir? Yes, it's my understanding it's been continued till when? October, October 20th. Sir, is it possible to One S. change it the 20th? I have a medical eye, eye appointment. Why don't we make it the, what date is the 20, is it, is that okay with you? The, the 27th? Right. Sure. What, is that fall on the, the right day? The 27th? Yes, Madam that's, Clark? That, that's three weeks from today. So why don't we do that? We'll continue it to uh, the 27th of this month. Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. And Benjamin is gone. Benjamin, okay, let us prepare to uh, vote. Let us open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 15 eyes. That brings us... Mr. Kokorian, I think we're on item three. Are we finished with that? I thought you held item three. Y yes, I did. Uh, I have a few questions for planning staff, please. Okay, so on uh, item three, if we could get the appropriate... There. There she is. Good morning, council members. You want to start with Mr. Weezer, or you want to just start this? No, I, it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll... I can't hear you. Afterwards. Okay, so... I, I can speak second. Thank you. Okay, Mr. so Mr. Kukori, and it would be appropriate for you to ask your questions. 
at this time. Okay, well, if, if I could ask before I get to my questions, maybe you could briefly state what the uh, proposed ordinance would do so that we can set up the context for the discussion. Sure, happy to. Uh, Patricia Diefender for Planning Department staff. Uh, so this ordinance is a, a new uh, ordinance that would be a, an amendment to the zoning code to create a zone that would allow for um, the regulation of a mix of uses in industrial areas that would include industrial, commercial, uh, live and live work uses. That's that's basically what it does. Okay, so um, members, the reason I wanted to have a discussion about this ordinance is, um, while there are certainly places in Los Angeles, like in Mr. Weezer's district, where we've done a, an incredible job of taking old and underutilized uh, industrial uh, and commercial space and turning it into outstanding uh, re residential and retail developments, uh, it, it, we have to look at the fact that Los Angeles uh, has the smallest amount of manufa available manufacturing land of any big city in America. Uh, we have one of the highest uh, uh, um, occupancy rates of our manufacturing space of any state, of any city in America. Uh, and manufacturing jobs uh, provide almost 10% of the county's employment. Los Angeles County is the number one manufacturing center in the country, and business uh, groups continue to tell us that one of the great challenges for job creation in the Los Angeles area is that there's inadequate amount of manufacturing available manufacturing land. There's uh, an inadequate amount of land available to invest in in the kind of ongoing job creating business investments that manufacturing represents. So I would say that my first concern is what this does what this has the potential of doing to our overall manufacturing stock uh, of land, of available land, number one. And number two, I'd like you to speak, if you would, please, to whether this could have the um, impact of moving large and dirty industrial businesses to the places like the San Fernando Valley, where those uses are, are currently now um, focused and concentrated. Uh, one of the challenges we're having in the San Fernando Valley is trying to um, lessen the impact of um, waste disposal and other auto dismantling and some of the other uh, large industrial, dirty industrial uses. If we're taking manufacturing uh, land away in some areas, doesn't that force manufacturing to go into the remaining areas like the valley where, where we're already disproportionately impacted. Um, second, if you have um, a zone that was historically manufacturing and then a uh, one of these hybrid zones uh, is, um, is overlaid on that or, or is, it's replaced with one of these hybrid zones, the existing manufacturing uses presumably would continue to be grandfathered. But what would happen if those existing uses wanted to invest, to expand, to change uh, or update their use? Would it have the impact of creating a legal non-conforming use, for example, if there's residential now developed within 500 feet of those uses? And, and how will we address those challenges? Uh, one additional point is the impact on affordability of housing. If our goal is to increase the housing stock uh, in the city, which I think all of us realize must be an important priority for this city, uh, the ordinance as it's presented does not really do much to, to add to affordability. In fact, it, cre it includes a greater bonuses than are available under our current density bonus uh, ordinance under section, uh, under uh, AB 1818, uh, SB 1818. So um, it seems to me this has kind of the, the, uh, uh, the, an adverse impact on affordability of housing rather than a beneficial impact. So those are a few of my uh, my questions that I uh, issues that I'd like you to address, and then I, I think some of these can be addressed, but they don't 
appear to be in the current ordinance, and, and I'd like to discuss with you some options for how we might be able to achieve the goal that this is intended to achieve while eliminating some of those potential adverse impacts that I've, I've described. So can you raise the, have a little bit of a discussion with us about some of the points that I've raised and whether those have been considered and what the potential risks there are? Okay. I'm happy to do that. Again, Patricia Diefendorfer, for the record. Um, so you had asked the question about what the potential of this ordinance, what the potential impact this ordinance has on our overall um, manufacturing land. And I would say that um, it's pretty clear in the ordinance and in the staff report, we've tried to put some definition on when this use of the zone is, you, when you'd be eligible for use of the zone. And um, we're trying... The characteristics of areas that are hybrid industrial are pretty unique. They're not found everywhere. We've been very explicit about the fact that this zone would not be suitable for many areas, industrial areas of the city. It's, it's more suited to places where you have, um, you've perhaps had a stock of uh, buildings, industrial buildings that lended themselves to adaptive reuse and therefore you have some live work units and kind of a, a residential base in those areas already. It's definitely more geared to places where you, that are transit served. Um, so yeah, where you already have like a diverse mix of uses. So the idea is not to have this be um, like every industrial area be converted to the zone. There's, it's really tailored for some very specific uses. And I think it's also important to say when you ask me what the zone was intended to regulate. Um, we the zone is not trying to create new conventional housing. The zone is trying to um, it's established a new use, a, li a live work use, and these units would not would be very different from conventional housing in the sense that they would be built to a certain standard. Uh, there's a new building code section, section 419, that allows for a mixing of live and work uses within a, a unit and there's some very stringent standards, more commercial standards that these units would have to comply with. So the idea is to create units that how that can house five employees, a maximum of five employees because that's what this new building code ordinance does and also to create spaces that are flexible and adaptable over time. These spaces could be used solely for business um, if, if, a, if someone who owned the space or rented the space chose to do so because of the way they would be constructed. So I just wanted to, to make that point. Um, and given the way the nature, the way that people are working, the nature of the way they work, it's changing, they want to live and work in the same place, this does have an opportunity to sort of expand the, the range of options for small businesses. Um, so you also asked about the impact that it might have on keeping, having very few options for where heavy industrial could be located if many industrial areas were uh, rezoned and redesignated to this industrial zone. First, I think it's important to point out that um, it will require, we're not rezoning as a part of this ordinance any properties currently. It would require the city council to adopt a plan amendment and approve a zone change. So every, every request would be uh, reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but again, as I mentioned in sort of answer to the first question, this is really supposed to have limited applicability. Uh, the idea is that this would not be suitable for many industrial areas, and there's really just a limited handful of industrial areas where it would be well-suited. And this actually is consistent with the 2007 industrial land use policy study, which identified dis discrete industrial areas where this kind of industrial mixed use environment exists today, and um, incorporating a mix of uses, including live work, would be appropriate. Um, so your third question was um, trying to, sorry, oh, would we be making any uses non-conforming um, by introducing w if any property was zoned to this zone? Again, that would have to go through a process that would involve city council approval, but given the, the areas that I described, the kind of unique characteristics that would be, need to be found in areas that would be suitable for this zone, it's largely areas where there really probably isn't the kind of heavy industry that exi you know existing any longer. The heavy industry has 
been sort of priced out of some of these areas. So, I mean, obviously, it would not be a goal of ours to try to make any uses nonconforming uh, as a result of this ordinance. And that could be something that we would look at as we're all evaluating um, any individual requests to use the zone. Uh, and then your final question, I think, was about uh, the impact on affordability uh, or affordable housing. The ordinance actually does have an affordable housing provision. This is a very u unique ordinance. It's structured. It's kind of like a tiered zoning uh, system that has been established in the ordinance. And once you introduce the live work zone above a one and a half to one FAR, which is the allowable FAR in most industrial areas today, um, you do have to provide an affordable component. And the affordability, uh, the percentages of affordability required match the state density bonus ordinance. And I think you mentioned um, that the, the bonuses are a little bit more generous than would be um, required in the, uh, from the state density bonus ordinance. But the reason that that is the case is because affordability is only one public benefit that this ordinance is requiring. So the building out the uh, live work units to that more stringent commercial strand standard is also viewed from a policy perspe perspective as a, a public benefit. And there's also other requirements uh, open space requirements, uh, pedestrian paseo requirements. There's a number of other requirements that collectively place uh, uh, you know, costs on development, and we're trying to help development be able to offset uh, the cost for that whole uh, package of public, public benefits, not just the affordable housing. So I hope that answers most of your questions. And OK, so if, if this is essentially an enabling an ordinance right. that gives the council the an option for future consideration of zoning changes in particular areas to this yes. um, then wouldn't it be appropriate to include in this a requirement that when the council does make zoning changes they make findings uh, to the effect that uh, for example the new use will not adversely impact uh, jobs that would otherwise be created by the highest and best use of the property um, that there is not a current uh, or past public health uh, I impact, adverse impact on public health in that area that would um, be harmful to residents who move into a residential area there. Um, perhaps uh, a finding that changing a zone in a particular area does not adversely impact uh, other areas of the city by displacing industry into other areas. I get that you're saying that in the sort of targeted areas that are anticipated to be used, that this is to be used. Uh, all of those things would, we, we would be able to easily make those findings. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that's not anything that's required, and this is an ordinance that would apply citywide. So um, could we have f a requirement of such findings like that in the ordinance? Patricia Diefender for Planning Department staff, for the record. Um, we can certainly uh, look into that approach. We can, I think through the form and legality process, we can look and see if there are other provisions that we can add to the ordinance that would help address some of the concerns that you have. I think it's important that we look at those things and have those options before the council. Um, it, you know, we're looking at a, a comprehensive job creation strategy for this city right now. One of the single biggest impediments to job creation that the city faces is uh, our manufacturing zones not being adequate. And I think that we at least ought to, if we're going to do this for old industrial zones that are no longer being used for those purposes, as you point out, and they're not suitable for manufacturing now, fine. Uh, but if this is going to have the impact on reducing the availability of land that could otherwise be used by job create, creating businesses, I would n not be supportive of something that you know allows someone to cash out on a development that displaces current and future job creating opportunities. So if we could include those when the ordinance comes back here, those sorts of options, uh, that would be helpful. If that's acceptable to Mr. Weizar. Thank you, Mr. Gakori, Mr. Weizar. Thank you, Madam President. And um, <clears throat> first, I want to thank the Planning Department for their hard work on this ordinance. It's been two years in the making, and uh, it's gone through several variations. Um, the latest in which is that 
uh, this started as a discussion in the arts district in downtown Los Angeles, where there was such a demand to convert some industrially zoned properties into residential and commercial and other uses, uh, given the transformation of that area. So there was an effort to try to control that huge demand in such a way that will put out for us in the front, what are the priorities for this city and what are the parameters should we engage in the discussion to rezone that property? Because right now, that demand is there such that if we do engage to rezone property, this type of discussion would happen. We would say, well, look, we prioritize and we value affordable housing. We value the creation of jobs. We value keeping the characteristic of that neighborhood. So why don't we take that all put it in an ordinance so when a developer comes to us and says, look, I'm interested in rezoning this land, this industrial zone, zone land, we say, well, there's this hybrid industrial ordinance that you could take advantage of that lays out what our priorities are instead of trying to negotiate each and every one and slowing down or even putting this in a, better, in a framework for us. So that's really I, what I think we set out to do. But once that was being discussed, um, the plan department said it's best just to put this out throughout the city because they're seeing this type of demand in other areas as well. And so uh, it then went through the uh, city planning commission and the planning and land use and management committee uh, discussed this on, on various times. And what I think we have is something that uh, will allow us to continue to take underutilized land. Now, I understand the concern we have as a city that we shouldn't do this on areas where we would possibly take away the creation, areas that we have creation of jobs. This is, I think, for that, that question has been answered for us already once we start making use of the ordinance. We have determined uh, through the negotiation process, through discussions, through community stakeholder meetings, uh, that this, any possibility of using this will, um, uh, we've already answered that question that it's not going to negatively impact jobs. But in fact, what we do, what we are doing is some requirements that they create some live work space if they create any residential area. Um, and this ordinance, just like any other ordinance or any other planning approval, will have to go through the regular process of seeker review, of zoning administrative hearings, et cetera, et cetera. So those discussions will take place. But I think it's a good thing. Um, in terms of what Mr. Krikorian has brought up, to put that up front in the findings that we should have that, just to make it crystal clear. That would come out anyway. That's the intention of the ordinance, is that we would only do this in those areas that are underutilized and we de have determined that no future jobs will take place. But uh, I think it's good to put that in there just to make sure up front. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that uh, this will allow us to make use of properties that have been sitting vacant for decades, where the old haystacks and types of manufacturing that we use in the past that those old buildings and uh, are, are no longer able to be utilized for any use and they're just sitting there empty not providing any jobs uh, that this live work ordinance will provide because of the live, live work requirements not providing any necessary housing and as we all heard we need to create more affordable housing so I, I think at the end of the day this is uh, the right way to move but at the same time do it in a very uh, methodical way and uh, responsible and slow way we've asked the planning department to come back with a report to our planning committee each year as to what we see is uh, as a result of this ordinance and is it, is it achieving the types of, uh, of, of goals we have set out for us. So we have that, that report that we expect from the planning department each, uh, each year to let us know which direction we're going. Um, so the findings on uh, that Mr. Krikorian have set out, I think they're good. Uh, they will be evaluated under CEQA, other things, but I think to set them out up front, it, it's a good thing just to be clear about that. And colleagues, I would ask for your I vote on this. Uh, this is simply to go out and ask the uh, city attorney to do the form and legality, come back to us, and we will look at the final form once that comes back to us as well. So thank you. I ask for an I vote. Mr. Krikorian? Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. So then I would ask that when the ordinance does come back uh, for our consideration, uh, that that come back also with a report uh, on uh, potential, the, the legality of, let's see, how should we phrase the report? A, a, re a report including options for the council to consider uh, regarding findings that there are no public health impacts uh, in the HI zone with regard to existing and historic industrial uses in the area that could cause a health risk to future residents, that there be an economic 
uh, finding that uh, the industrial land in the area was no longer viable and necessary for manufacturing uh, use, uh, and uh, a finding that um, the relocation that there, that there would not be a potential for relocation of potential heavy industry uses to other parts of the city that would be adverse to those other parts of the city. Okay. So if I could ask for that report back with the ordinance um, so that we could consider those options then, that would be fine. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gregorian. There are no more speakers on this item. Madam Clerk, open the roll. Close the roll. And tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. And it's adopted as amended. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, I'd like to reconsider an item from, a, from our agenda on September 22nd. Council file 15-0160-S403. I'd like the item to be continued for four weeks. So, Madam President, uh, since um, all items went forthwith on September 22nd, first council should vote to suspend the rules. Okay, let's do that. Open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. Now council votes on reconsideration. Let's open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. Thank you. And um, just for the record, that item is uh, continued uh, to November 10th. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Let's move on to uh, public comment. First speaker, Sean. Yes, good morning, Sean, CD2. Uh, let's keep, let's keep the, you know the rains are coming. Keep the storm, clean up the storm drains and rain gutters in all apartment and housings. Please clean up your gutters. The rain's coming. It's not a joke. Uh, Starbucks is being built on Burbank and Laurel Canyon. We're excited about it. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised it's being built real fast. Yeah. Uh, does, the crosswalk on, on St. Charles Barmeo is still faded. The cars are not stopping. Uh, we need to do something about that. Thank you, Sean. Next uh, speaker, Harrison Hill. Hi, good morning. Oh, hello? Hey, good morning. My name is Harrison Hill. Um, I'm coming out of Venice, and uh, I wanted to speak today about the bicycles, the skateboards, and the scooters on the sidewalk. I think it's a problem. Uh, a buddy of mine is like, 61 years old, and uh, we were going for a walk yesterday. Skateboard came from behind, bike came from the front, and uh, he almost got injured. I got a bad ankle, and I don't think it's right that pedestrians on the sidewalk have to maneuver around uh, vehicles like that. I think they should take it on the road. Mothers with strollers, I completely understand, but if you're talking about uh, skateboards and stuff, I think that's got to be on the street, and uh, I have issue with that, and I'd like to see something done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, John Walsh. John Walsh at Hollywood, HollywoodHighlands.org or jwalshconfidential.com. Saturday night, a man was standing on the corner of, in Van Nuys. He was shot to death by the police. The police claim that he threw a, a beer bottle through their back window, and they thought it was a, a, a gunshot. A gunshot? A, a beer bottle? That's ridiculous. They jumped out of their car and they shot the man dead. That was Saturday. Three days later, they refused to release any information concerning the murdered victim. Was he black? And I'm telling you right now, 
black people are not welcome in the valley. And if you try anything in the valley, they're going to shoot first and ask questions later. If this guy was a white guy, they would have announced it we, uh, two days ago. Blacks, stay out of the valley. Next speaker, Eduardo Martinez. And Madam President, the speakers should be reminded not to yell into the uh, microphones. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Eduardo Martinez. I work for AHF. That's AIDS Care Foundation. And I'm here to remind our council president that the majority of the health commissioners have been appointed. Why hasn't been a meeting been the first meeting taking place? The health commission was adopted by the city council. It could, been, it could have been on the ballot. So why is the city council taking such a long time in order to take the first meeting of the health commissioner? There are health crisis issues that we're facing in LA City, and yet have, has been more than a year since the city voted for the health commission, and it seems that like it's going to take another year before all the commissioners make their appointments. As of right now, Bob Blumenfeld from this city has not named no one to the commission. Mr. Price, you are my representative. I think he left. Thank you. Hasn't very named much, anybody sir. else. So Thank please. You. Your time is up. Thank you. The next speaker is Shai DeWitt McComan. I hope I have that correct. Followed by Guillermo Fre Fregosa. Go ahead, Good sir. Good morning, President and Council. My name is Shai McConan. I'm 29 years old and a longtime resident of Los Angeles County. I'm tremendously concerned with the health crisis within the city. As advocates, we have been here many times. There, thus, every time the council states that there will be a setup of a health commission, and yet a month goes by and there still isn't one in place. So I believe if the council is not going to act on this matter, my suggestion is that maybe it should go to the voters. I do want to thank the council for taking the time and hearing this concern, yet I do want to express that they should take action with urgency. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, Arturo Arias. I'm sorry, Guillermo Fregoso, followed by Arturo Arias. Uh, is somebody available to translate me? Sure. Please. Is our translator here? Uh, buenos días, miembros del Concilio de la Ciudad de Los Ángeles. Good morning, members of the City of Los Ángeles. Mi nombre es Guillermo Fregoso. My name is Guillermo Fregoso. Y soy residente del Condado de Los Ángeles por 35 años. I'm a resident of the County of Los Ángeles for 35 years. Soy un paciente diagnosticado con SIDA hace 23 años. I am a patient that has been diagnosed with AIDS for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Y sé de la importancia de, de esta Comisión de Salud En el condado de, aquí en el condado de Los Ángeles. And I know the importance of the of this health uh, committee, committee in the city of Los Angeles. Para que empiece a trabajar lo más pronto posible. So they can start working as soon as possible. Uh, para el bien de todos los residentes del condado de Los Ángeles. For the well-being of all the residents of the county of Los Angeles. Yo les pido por favor a todos ustedes. I ask you, please, all of you. Que hagan todo lo posible para que esta comisión de salud. To do everything that is possible by this commission of health. Que se encargue de los numerosos problemas de que tenemos aquí en el condado de Los Ángeles. To take care of all the number of problems that we have here in the city of Los Ángeles, in the Muchas county gracias. of Los Ángeles. Thank you very much. The next speaker, Arturo Arias. Good morning. Miembros del Concilio de la Ciudad de Los Ángeles. Members of the City of Los Angeles, Council, uh, City Council of Los Angeles. Mi nombre es Arturo Arias. My name is Arturo Tengo Arias. Tengo 40 años. I am 40 years old. Vivo aquí en Los Angeles. I live here in Los Angeles. Así como yo, hay, uh, Hay un gran número de personas indocumentadas. Like me, there are a serious number of people that are undocumented. En el condado de Los Ángeles. In the county of Los Angeles. 
Es importantísimo que la Comisión de Salud, de Salud comience a trabajar lo más pronto posible. It is very important that the Health Commission start working as soon as possible. Para el bien de todos nosotros. For the well-being of all of us. Parece ser que ustedes, los miembros del Concilio de la Ciudad de Los Ángeles, it seems like the, you, the members of the city of uh, the members of the city of Los Angeles, no escuchan la uh, no escucha la urgencia de nosotros los residentes de Los Ángeles. Do not listen to the urgency of us, the city, the residents of the city of Los Angeles. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next up, speaker Eric Previn. Is he here? Mr. Previn, you are not in the room. Next speaker, Byron Barajas. Mr. Barajas, are you here? Um, I have turned in a, a leaflet uh, entitled For Urgent Attention of Congressmen, Senators, and Other Members of the U.S. Government, and uh, also anybody else uh, who can assist in this. I think it was clear that one of the reasons why uh, this country and your city particularly uh, hasn't been uh, producing in terms of your manufacturers, and that's another question, what are you producing? You can't just produce anything and call it manufacturing. But I think the emergency here is to bring back the Glass-Steagall law. I can tell you that um, Goldman Sachs has called, and the Fed has called out for a quantitative easing for another bailout in by January of next year. What that actually means is there will be no recovery. So we just got to throw Obama out past Glass-Steagall. Thank you. Next speaker, David Hernandez, followed by Henry Marin. Uh, good morning, council members. Uh, good morning, Los Angeles. David Hernandez. And can I have the officer uh, pass these out? Uh, I'm uh, here representing Churches in Action for Los Angeles and the uh, All Communities Matter Clean Up Los Angeles campaign. I just wanted to give you an update. The first two weeks, uh, the residents, mainly of, of uh, Council District 8 and 9, brought in 227,000 pounds of trash that was delivered at back to recycling for free. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Kikorian's office for uh, sending the message out and Councilmember Sadeo's office for being very supportive of that effort. Uh, the effort was so successful as that we are continuing the effort indefinitely. The flyer that is being passed out today has to do with the uh, the October 15th date, however, since it has been so successful uh, that uh, Mr. Earl Siegel, the owner of the company, is extending that. Now, we realize that having a uh, company located at Slauson and Western is not convenient for members of the San Fernando Valley, so we would encourage council members and other districts to extend that invitation to thank other you, businesses to participate. So thank, thank you. you very much for all your help. Next speaker, Henry Marin. Yes, Ms. Martinez, as you know, MOU defined deductions account for every cent city, county, and hackle officials sheltered from pay of craftsmen in LA in lieu of providing the provision some do for novel government service in LA. And as you know, this money was held under public private partnership, and not one cent of this money was provided to public employee pension benefit fund administrators as required by law and, had, and accounted for as required by California Government Code 20305. Consequently, you now have to make back payments to public employee pension benefit plans for benefit of each one of these employees. <laughs> and you've been knowing it for a thousand years ever since Mr. Dion Roberts told y'all it was legal to use the money as agreed by the CEO and unions in L.A. on October 26, 2010. And what the hell is your problem? Y'all slow learners. Bill Wat Watkins is the next speaker. Good morning. Uh, nice to be back. I've vowed to stay away from uh, commenting on agenda items. That was a fiasco last time I tried to do that. And uh, if Mr. Englander was still here, I'd apologize. You know, the, 
it becomes a fire pit. And I'm so grateful there's no heckling today in the meetings. I don't know what's changed, but thanks for that. And whoever is working on that, fantastic. Um, it's a great day, and it, it's really fun to pick up trash. Um, I've picked up six black bags in my district, District 14, uh, since Friday. Uh, I love it. No one's paying me. Um, I'll go over to the mayor's office and see if I can pick up some volunteer core material. Deanna, um, and for anybody who want to check their districts out, I know that ours needs help with gutters, and not only gutters, but uh, drains. Uh, the drains are clogged. So, Deanna, if you can make a note of that. I didn't tell Paul that drains are clogged. And, um, gosh, get out of those suits and, and pick up some trash with me today. I recommend it. It's a really nice day. God bless you. Thank you so much. Madam Kirk, that concludes public comments. What's before us? Uh, Madam President, the city attorney has an announcement he needs to make. Mr. City Attorney. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Just for the record on item number two, the application for determination of public convenience or necessity was denied because the applicant withdrew the application. Very well. Thank you uh, very much. Again, Madam Clerk, what's before us? Council has motions for posted and referral. Posted and referred. That clears the desk. Any members, any announcements? No, can we all please rise for adjourning motions? To my right, any adjourning motions? Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Madam President. This past Thursday, we lost one of the legendary rabbis of our time, Rabbi Jacob Pressman, who passed away in his sleep at the age of 95. He was a longtime leader of the Los Angeles Jewish community and established Temple Beth Am, which would become one of the largest conservative temples in the West, and which he led for more than 35 years. And even after his retirement from Temple Beth Am in 1985, he continued to be a wonderful speaker there for decades. Uh, he also helped found other very significant Jewish institutions in our community, including Camp Ramah, Akiva University, uh, Academy, the Brandeis Bardeen Institute, the Los Angeles Hebrew High School, the University of Judaism, which later became known as the American Jewish University, uh, Rabbi Jacob Pressman Academy, which is a combination of nursery, elementary, and secondary schools connected to Temple Beth Am, and Beth Am Manor, which is a low-rent residence for seniors. He was a wonderful human being, funny, wise, willing to be humorous and tell jokes and even sing show tunes if the cause warranted it. But he was also there to take on many serious causes. Uh, for example, he was a longtime champion for Soviet Jews when they needed great advocacy to enable them to emigrate from persecution uh, in the 70s. He joined Martin Luther King Jr. in Montgomery, Alabama in the protest march uh, of 1965. He created one of America's first Holocaust memorials, wrote two books and weekly columns for the Beverly Hills Courier, served as chair of the Jewish Federation, was past president of the Western Region of Rabbinical Assembly, and president of the Board of Rabbis of Los Angeles. He was also the founding president of the Maple Counseling Center. Rabbi Pressman will always be remembered in loving memory by countless congregants and other friends through the community, not only because he was a wondrous rabbi, but because of his manner. He was a rabbi who wouldn't hesitate to visit door to door, so often speaking to families and individuals at one, one at a time and face to face, and always remembering their names and the detail of, of their lives, while counseling and inspiring them in the most personal, honest, respectful, and meaningful way. He is survived by his wife, Marjorie, his wife of more than 70 years, his son, Daniel, who's also a rabbi, um, daughter, Judy, five grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. His son, Joel, a teacher at Beverly Hills High School, passed away in 2014. He'll be much missed and always treasured. Thank you, Mr. Roof. Madam President, thank you. Today, I would like to adjourn in the memory of Leslie Louise Den Denelian, who passed away peacefully on the morning of September 18th after a two and a half year battle with brain cancer. Leslie was born June 12th, 1959 to Luis and Richard Danilian here in Los Angeles. She attended University High School before studying English at USC. Among her many talents, Leslie was an incredible cook. She set up a catering company which eventually led to, her, to, her, her, to opening her own restaurant 
Sweet Butter Kitchen in Sherman Oaks, which was a huge success. But all of her incredible achievements, her greatest accomplishment was raising her two children, Andrew and Emily. Leslie was an incredible comfort to all those around her and all those who knew and loved her, loved her are suffering a deep loss. She is survived by her mother, Louise Danilian, her children's Andrew and Emily Smith, her loving husband, Richard Burge, and her brother, Stephen Danilian. In Leo Flowers, the family is asking that we please consider a donation to the UCLA Neurosciences Department. Thank you, and may all your thoughts and prayers today be with the family and friends of Leslie Danilian. Sorry to hear that Mr. Roos, uh, Sweet Butter is an amazing restaurant. Condolences to her family. Mr. Kokorian. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, members, on October 1st, our country suffered its 294th mass shooting of 2015, when Umpqua Community College was devastated uh, by a mass murderer who took the lives of young people who were trying to build a future for themselves, uh, people who were trying to transform their lives, people who were trying to change the lives of others. In the five days since the Umpqua Community College shooting, we've had three more mass shootings in this country, but they didn't make the headlines. But for the moment, I'd ask that we adjourn the city council, this city council meeting, in memory of Quinn Cooper, age 18, Rebecca Carnes, age 18, Lucas Ibel, age 19, Lucero Alcarez, 19, Trevin Anspach, age 20, Jason Johnson, age 33, Serena Moore, age 44, Kim Dietz, age 59, and Larry Levine, age 67. And may their families find some peace and comfort in this absolutely um, unexplainable, horrid tragedy. I'd also ask, Madam President, if I could, um, that we adjourn in memory of Michaela Dyer. Michaela was eight years old, and on Saturday she was playing with a puppy. Her neighbor, who was aged 11, wanted to play with the puppy, and when she told him no, he went to his house, got his unlocked, fully loaded, 12-gauge shotgun from his father's closet, and he killed Michaela over the puppy. After a long history of Michaela's mother complaining about the bullying that she'd received from this 11-year-old, nonetheless, this 11-year-old's parents found it appropriate to have a fully loaded, unlocked shotgun in the closet. I ask that we adjourn the council in memory of Michaela Dyer. Thank you, Mr. Kokorin. Mr. Englander. Um, colleagues, I'm sure many of you, Roberta Boardman as well, as I did, and it was with great sadness that I adjourn in her memory. She passed away, however, peacefully with her family by her side on September 18 in Northridge, California, after a long illness with lung cancer. Born and raised in the San Fernando Valley, Roberta was a self-proclaimed original Valley girl. After being a stay-at-home mom, she became a VISTA volunteer for two years in identifying and setting up programs for emergency food and housing for those in need throughout the San Fernando Valley. She was then hired to be part of the LA City family, where she was the deputy to Los Angeles City Council members Joy Pikus and then Joel Wax. She was also a consultant with Delphi Associates, executive director of the Tarzana Chamber of Commerce, and office administrator for the California State PTA. She was active in numerous organizations, such as the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, San Fernando Valley Girl Scout Council, ha Haven Hills, West Valley Pals, Guadalupe Youth Center, Sherwood Forest Homeowners Associate, Association, 4-H Clubs, the League of Women Voters, the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association, the LA Philharmonic, and the San Fernando Valley Chapter of the National 
Women's Political Caucus. Our deepest sympathies go to her family. She leaves behind her children, Bridget, Julie, Wendy, and Robert, and her nine grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, and two twin sisters. Roberta is now with her departed soulmate, Dallas, who unfortunately left her in March 2009. A celebration of her life will be held at 2 o'clock p.m. on October 10th at the Lifehouse Church located at 18355 Roscoe Boulevard in Northridge, California. In lieu of flowers, the family is asking donations to be made in Roberta's honor to the National Women's Political Caucus, San Fernando Valley Chapter. Uh, she was a dear friend and a true Valley girl. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you that had the fortunate experience of knowing Roberta and working with her, she always showed up to everything with a smile, uh, asking to help. She, um, she always had uh, an opinion of everything and everyone, and it was always positive, and she always wanted to share it. She was always full of life and wanting to give back and make our community a better place, and I know she's done that. And um, she will be missed. May Roberta Boardman forever rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Thank you, colleagues. I'd like to adjourn today in memory of a constituent of mine, Jack Larson of Brentwood, who passed away uh, during our recess at age 87. Uh, Jack was a native of Los Angeles. He was a playwright, a screenwriter, uh, a producer, and an actor. Most of us will remember him uh, from his most prominent acting role as Jimmy Olsen on the 1950s uh, George Reeves series, The Adventures of Superman. It was a role he was very reluctant to take because he was afraid he would get typecast. And uh, his agent talked him into it, saying the show will probably never even air, just take it. He took the job, and of course he was typecast, and it was hard for him to escape that role. So uh, he moved into behind-the-screens work and actually did uh, a lot of great work, but never shied away from his, uh, his role as Jimmy Olsen and co-starred or did cameo appearances in uh, Lois and Clark and the Superboy television show. But there's something else about Jack Larson that I think is remarkable that I'd like him to be remembered for. At a time when gay men would marry women in the 1950s and the 1960s, at a time when Hollywood made arranged marriages or fake partnerships for their actors and actresses, uh, Jack Larson was not particularly ostentatiously but unapologetically openly gay and was in a long-term relationship, lived in Brentwood uh, with his partner, James Bridges, from 1958 until James died in 1993. Uh, and uh, that was uh, an incredible and unusual thing at that time. And uh, I was proud he was a constituent of mine. Uh, he was much loved in Brentwood and in Hollywood and, and beyond. So I'd like us to adjourn in his memory today. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonin. Mr. Wiesar. Thank you, Madam and colleagues asked that we adjourn in memory of a great Al Sereno resident, Gilbert Elias Chico. He grew up in Al Sereno and attended Wilder Wilson High School and graduated in 1974. He played uh, various sports, including being a star on the varsity basketball team. He loved the Los Angeles Lakers, but loved his UCLA Bruins even more, having season tickets to football and basketball there, and he never missed one of those games. He came from a great musical family, the Chico Band, uh, that played at various at our community events. Uh, he enjoyed uh, playing guitar for family and friends as well, but what he loved most was spending time with his family. Uh, his late father, uh, Elias Chico, founded the Chicana Nurses Program while employed at the Los Angeles County Health Department. Uh, he is survived by his mother, Amelia, brothers Benjamin and Elias, sisters Angie and Lisa, and many other family members. Uh, condolences to his family and friends and the El Sereno community certainly will miss uh, a great brother. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Weezer. I see no other adjourning motions. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.